And welcome, everybody, to another episode of Finns Nation. I am your host, Lewis Sung, and today I am joined by the head of the Five Reasons Sports Network, Ethan Skolnick, to talk about the Miami Dolphins. We're going to get a little bit more into how the Miami Dolphins did defeat the New England Patriots on Sunday Night Football. So primetime football, everybody watching, and the Dolphins once again came up big. They are now 2-0 and and in sole possession of the AFC East. So the real question that I would have at this point is, can they maintain this momentum through the first stretch of their season. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. But before that, really quick, just want to go ahead and mention that, as always, this show is brought to you by our good friends over at prizepicks.com. Prizepicks.com is a revolutionary fantasy platform where you can now pick up to six different players across professional sports leagues. Whether that's the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, one of each, it's up to you to decide. Just choose whether your chosen player will get more or less in their projected stat. They give you free squares, special Taco Tuesday promos, Flex Friday specials where you can get your money back if you lose or multiply the amount of money you can normally win. So with offers like that, it's hard to justify not signing up if you're any kind of a fantasy sports fan. So use the promo code 5, that's F-I-V-E, and they will match up to $100 on your initial deposit when you sign up. Give us promo code 5, F-I-V-E. Go to pricepix.com, deposit your $100, and let Pricepix give you 100 of their dollars for you to play with and get started winning today. This show is also brought to you by our good friends over at the Biscayne Bay Brewing Company. They are the ones that we were doing the Five Reasons Sports Dolphins watch parties at. They have $6 beers on Sundays. And if you were joining us for the watch parties, you got a free beer just by mentioning that we are part of the Five Reasons Sports Network. So it's very easy, very great place to watch Dolphins football or any other sport for that matter. They are the only independently and locally owned brewery in downtown Miami. In fact, they're the only brewery, period, in downtown Miami. So make sure you go check them out. The official logger of the Miami Marlins and partner of the Miami Heat, Biscayne Bay Brewing Company, proud sponsor of the Five Reasons Sports Network. And Ethan, I believe that you had one more thing that you wanted to mention as well. Yeah, I also want to mention our betting partner, Better Edge. Just go to betteredge.com. Use the code 5RSN. You get $20 to play. And we've got our weekly competitions there. And if you're worried about illegal sports betting, this is legal sports betting. Even in the state of Florida where it's not fully legal yet, Better Edge is. Go to betteredge.com and use the code 5RSN. All right. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. So three wonderful sponsors for this show and the, for the network in general. So Ethan, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. A lot of stuff has happened. And even as we get ready for the Miami Dolphins to face the Denver Broncos for their first home game of the season, the real question at this point is, can they keep up this momentum? We all, we all For the past couple of weeks, we had amazing highs and some scares, I should say. Like, I don't know if you were, I know we left the, the Brewing Company a little bit early because it's Sunday night. Football night being the key word here. So we're looking at, oh, my gosh, it's going to be like one in the morning when we're doing post game. We don't want to be here all night. But it was still a fun time. But I digress. We were watching the game and we had this moment where we thought it was all going to fall apart. And then the referees actually made the right call for once in New England for the Dolphins. And it actually turned out that that was going to be the difference maker that let the Dolphins win the game because whoever the offensive lineman was, I can't even remember the guy's name, but Mike Kosicki laddered it to him. He didn't quite make it to the first down marker, and that was the end of the game. So many people were frustrated saying they should have just given him the first down. No, they shouldn't have given him the first down because he did not reach the marker. <laughs> if it had been the Dolphins doing that, nobody was going to be saying that, but that's a different story. So, now I want to know, can they keep up this momentum? We're looking at we're looking ahead at the schedule, and we've got now the Denver Broncos is going to be coming up this upcoming Sunday, and then I believe the Buffalo Bills right after that. So we've already going to be facing two of our AFC East rivals this season so far. We beat New England. Could we beat Buffalo? Could we really start off this season 4-0? And the way that these Dolphins are playing right now and the way that these other teams are playing, it looks like that's a very real possibility here. Yeah, it is. And I, I think what's impressive about – these first two wins, I mean, obviously them being on the road is the key thing, but that they had to win two completely different ways. And I think that's what you want to see. There's only two undefeated teams in the AFC right now. It's Miami and it's Baltimore. So, I mean, you have a league uh, with a lot of parity right now. We thought that the AFC would have parity, particularly because there seem to be 10 or 11 reasonably strong teams uh, vying for the spots. But, you know, the Dolphins in the first game, they want to shoot out. And, you know, they turned it over to Tua. And he outplayed Herbert by a significant amount, uh, particularly when it mattered. Hill was unbelievable. Obviously, Waddle contributed. They threw a lot to Smythe. He spread the ball around. Darius made big plays. Offensive line kept him clean. Uh, and that's how they won. But in the second game, you know, they played the three, the three deep safeties. Um, they, uh, you know, Be Belichick essentially was not going to let Tua beat him uh, on a consistent basis. Now, he did beat him on the one drive, the, the no huddle drive where he was seven of seven getting the ball out quickly to, to, to receivers, making the right decisions. 
But for the most part, he wasn't going to just let him chuck it around. And the big question, and I know you did a, you did an episode on this, would Mike McDaniel stay with a run if that's what was offered to him? And he did. And they won essentially a grinded out game. Now, I said the game would be 24-13. That was pretty damn close. Um, it's pretty much how it played out. And, yeah, they caught some breaks at the end. There's some mistakes. Two is, you know, had some beautiful throws. He had the one big mistake. He's got to avoid that mistake. It seems to happen uh, pretty regularly in these types of games. But now their position with a Denver team coming in that's not very good. Um, that's not one of the stronger teams in the AFC. Russell Wilson is not the Russell Wilson he used to be. We used to talk about could Tua someday be Russell Wilson. Well, right now, Tua is better than Russell Wilson. And so, at least at this stage of their respective careers. So, you, you've got a home opener. I, I think they're in really good position uh, here to get off to a great start. And that's the thing. When you start winning different ways, then your confidence grows. And this is a team that has not had its starting left tackle has not had its playmaking cornerback, and they are still 2-0. and And I, that's a really good sign right now. And that's the thing that I wanted to bring up is that there was a stat, and I don't remember who tweeted it out, but basically the Dolphins have – Tua, I should say Tua. Tua has won his last nine games against Super Bowl-winning head coaches. So obviously he's beaten Belichick. He's had opportunities to beat a lot of other coaches in the past few years that have been head, the Super Bowl winning type coaches. So now he's going to be facing another one in Sean Payton. And everybody was looking at Sean Payton like he was going to be like the savior for the Denver Broncos. He was the one who was going to bring Russell Wilson back from the brink, going to revitalize his career to some extent. I have not seen that so far. And there, it's very interesting how this team in particular, there's so many personal stakes for so many different players, because especially when it comes to the Broncos, Butch Berry as the offensive line coach, they slandered him up and down over there in Denver, talked about how awful he was so far. He seems to be doing a really good job with these offensive linemen here in Miami. He's managed to make Austin Jackson look competent. Kendall Lamb looks like a legitimate starter in the league. And obviously we have other guys that we're trying to develop and get them grown. So that way we don't have to continue to use Teron Armstead forever. We would, we don't want to have to use him as a crutch for the next several years. And then there's also the fact that Sean Payton himself has spent the, he spent the year last season just slandering Tua left and yeah. right. And you would think, you would think as somebody who worked with Drew Brees was very, mm -hmm. very close with Drew Brees would mm -hmm. recognize a lot of the same traits in Tua that he had in Drew Brees, but he went full on the opposite and just basically despised everything to a tongue of Iloa. It's just so bizarre sport. how Sean Payton feels about it. It was sport. And then, you know, you look at it too, like, again, not only did he have Drew Brees who there were a lot of comparisons of Tua too, but now he's coaching a guy who too has been compared to in some ways, uh, at least when Russ was playing at a high level that you could do it without, you know, great height that, you know, and, and some of the things that, and, and with touch and accuracy and, and the kind of things, I mean, you know, Russ throws the moon ball and maybe a little bit more mobile than, than Tua, but, uh, but there are some similarities in the way that they play. And actually there's some similarities to the start of their careers. I, I did this a couple of years ago when Tua was a rookie and Tua's numbers early on were pretty similar to Russ's numbers early on before Russ started being entrusted with the Seattle offense in a full way, when they were more of a running team and Legion of Boom and all that with Marshawn and, and their defensive backs. So uh, it is a strange deal. And I, look, I, I think that, you know, guys like Sean Payton, uh, is he a good head coach? Yes. Uh, but sometimes we get enamored with these guys. And when, when they're on their second or third turn, you know, and we saw it with Parcells, we saw it with others. It's not quite the same. You know, it's not as when you're building an organization from the ground up. And a lot of times these guys, too, they go on, you know, they become, you know, studio analysts and all that. And then they know everything. Right. And then they come back to the game and it's not so easy. This happened with Dick Vermeil. It ha it's happened with a ton of guys. I don't know that he's going to succeed in Denver. I really don't. Um, you know, I don't think they have great personnel offensively. It's pretty clear that they're starting and playing Russ because they have to, not because they want to. Uh, I don't think that there was ever really a hope of getting him back to the level he used to be at. It's just get him to a competent level. It's kind of where Cleveland is with Deshaun Watson right now. That um, These are two guys who a ton of money was given to. Obviously, Russ didn't have the personal stuff that Deshaun had. But these are huge contracts for guys who are really bottom third starting quarterbacks right now. Like, I mean, legitimately. Like, they're, they're – and they're – you would take 20 guys over both of these guys uh, at this stage. So, um, you know, look, I, I Tua, I think, internalizes this stuff. He knows what's said about him. And I, I think he'll have a little something for, uh, you know, for Peyton on Sunday. 
Well, he's going to have an easier time because let me tell you something. As much as we like like to laugh at the fact that Bill Belichick is throwing flags on the ground and acting like a spoiled child, like he's still a very good head coach and he's still a very good defensive coach. Meanwhile, uh, Sean Payton is struggling with his offense and his defensive coordinator is somebody that the Dolphins used to have not too long ago. And it was a miserable experience. And it's still a miserable experience from what I can tell because – I don't know why – I'm starting to wonder why everybody likes Vance Joseph so much because everybody keeps talking about how great of a coach he is, but it seems like everywhere Vance Joseph goes, his defense is not good, and it hasn't been good so far this season either. Is it just a lack of personnel? Is it something else? Is it just that he's not good at what he does? I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I don't want to say that uh, Vance Joseph is somewhere like along the lines of Matt Burke. I feel like even that's too insulting for Vance Joseph, but it's pretty clear that – we want to talk about revenge. Vic Fangio, back when he was the head coach, he got fired by the Broncos. And now – Vance Joseph, correct? Yeah, no, that's that's another thing. And, and and I think that was one of the things we didn't talk about as much after the second game, but probably should have, is that Fangio got a lot of heat for the season opener. And, uh, I mean, I think rightfully so because they just gashed them up the middle. I mean, I, they just – I mean, but – you saw them close down some of those things against the Patriots. Uh, and, you know, I thought their game plan against Mac was good. Um, you know, you know what kind of quarterback he is and he's going to dink and dunk, but they, they contained it. Uh, they did not allow, you know, sort of the missed tackles, the big plays. And I thought Fangio's scheme uh, worked out well for them and they'll settle mm-hmm. in more with him as they go forward. I, I thought the other encouraging thing defensively for Miami was you want to see X, Xavier Howard be a playmaker again. And, I, you know, he was a playmaker in this game, and that's a positive. And they're going to need that until they get healthier on the back end uh, with Needham and Ramsey ultimately. So I, I think that they're really well positioned right now. And it's different, Lewis, having a home game when you're 2-0, and you know, having your first home game. If you come in 0-2 or 1-1, and crowd's into it, but it's more of, okay, we're going to tailgate, we're going to hang out and all this. But is when you're going to see a two and O team uh, that is one of two undefeated teams in the AFC, you've got a likable, productive, playmaking, ascending quarterback, um, and you got a lot of players who are playing at a high level right now. That place is going to be loud on Sunday. And again, they're facing a team that I just don't think has the personnel to beat them if they play at a high level. So I saw the spread was seven. Uh, I think that's about where it should be, uh, and I, I think they'll clear it. I am absolutely agree with that. Um, just to quickly clarify, because uh, I just looked it up because I wasn't sure. I knew that at one point they were both the head coach, but I wasn't sure the order. Uh, so Vance, Vance, Vance Joseph, first. Vance Joseph was first, and then they okay. fired him to hire Fangio, okay. and then they fired Fangio after 2021. So uh, right. it has not been that long since Vic Fangio was a head coach in the NFL. So talk about a re- again, like I said, revenge game all around. So revenge for Butch Berry, revenge for Tua, revenge for Fangio. So I can't imagine that they're going to come in here. Oh, and by the way, uh, Bradley Chubb, they traded. Yeah. <laughs> they traded him. So, And that's coming off the heels of the game he had against the Patriots. He just had his best game as a Dolphin. You know, we, we, you know I said before the second game, you know, who, who was the target on the back of in that game? Uh, Christian Wilkins, who I thought played much better. Bradley Chubb, who played much better. Uh, and then two guys who didn't, uh, uh, Connor Williams, who did the block, the blocking is fine. The snapping is not, uh, that needs to be fixed. And of course our guy, Jason Sanders, who I, I really am surprised at this point that we're not seeing them bring in anybody to at least get a look on a Tuesday. I, I just, you know, look, if you're comfortable with Sanders from 45 in, I get it. Um, I know you're not necessarily, but it's not. You can't have a kicker in the modern NFL. We've talked about this before, it's like beating a dead horse at this point, but I just don't think you can have a kicker in the modern NFL who you just don't trust to kick for 50-plus. I mean, he's got to he's gotta be able to make – I mean, some of these guys are, are 75% from from 50-plus, and with Sanders, it's 0%. He, he can't make a kick past 50, and you know that was part of the criticism of the McDaniel move. I, I would have gone for it there, um, but he talked again about having the snap issues. So these things are kind of playing into each other, the snapping issues – led into him not wanting to go for it there and take the risk, but then you're putting it in the foot of your kicker and, the, and your kicker's foot is not reliable from distance. And I, I just think you can't, you can't have a team of this quality, which I think the Dolphins are putting out there and risk it, uh, you know, f- with a kicker who may drop you a game or two. They're very fortunate. He hasn't cost them one of these first two games with a missed extra points, the block kick, 
and the Miss Deep one, uh, they're gonna have they have to bring in some competition. I've been, I've just been saying it for two years now. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, uh, I've talked about this many times before. He, the moment that Jason Sanders fired Brent Gravelichov as his offseason kicking coach, things seemed to go sour almost immediately. I feel like maybe I don't know what the relationship was there. I don't know how it went sour, if it did go sour at all, or if it was just a matter of they um, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? A mutual parting of ways, so to speak. But either way, ever since Gravelichov left Sanders, he has not been the same kicker. It has been severely troubling how far he's fallen down at this point so now if you're going to go ahead and look at the free agents list i mean there's not really a whole lot of guys here that i would look at and say oh yeah i 100 believe that this guy would be better than who we already have because i'm looking at the list here and i guess i'm trying to i'm trying to find one that spot track is even showing that brett maher is available he is not he is not available uh i even looked at matt prater he's with the cardinals so he's not available Trying to continue to go down the list here. Um, Matt Gay. Matt Gay is with the Colts, so he is not available. So just trying to look at all these guys here. How about Mason Crosby? Is Mason Crosby available? Would he be somebody that the Dolphins could look at? Stay forever. So he is a free agent, but he's 39 years old. And I, I just don't know how much worse it could get, honestly. I, I, I don't. I mean, I, you know, Sanders made a huge kick at the end of last year, and it felt like that washed everything away, right? Um, but it doesn't, I mean, you still have to make the kicks going forward and I don't, I don't want to pick on the guy. I know you don't either, but it matters. I mean, it matters. I mean, when you have an elite kicker, it, I mean, Baltimore has an elite kicker and, and if it, if, you know, that's a very good team. And if it comes down to a Baltimore Miami game and it's decided by a kick, I'm taking the Ravens. And, and that's, and again, you're not, you're not playing to be competitive. You're playing to go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> Um, and I, I just, it's just a position that I don't think it's funny. I think all dolphin fans were concerned about it, but we talked a lot more about the offensive line. We talked a lot more about, you know, other positions and, and the, the, the depth issues in the secondary, uh, with all the injuries, but I don't think we've talked enough about, I mean, this is a, a critical part of the game that, uh, could cost them. And that's, that's just where we're at. Yeah. The dolphins next, next season at the very latest, they need they to got- absolutely bring someone in. I draft a guy. I mean, honestly, I draft a guy in the first five rounds. I, I to me, it's that important. Uh, well, I mean, they they did they did draft Jason Sanders in the seventh round when he was around. So, I mean, I right. personally feel yeah. like I, I feel like that if they're going to draft somebody, it doesn't need to be that way. I still remember who was the guy that the Buccaneers had drafted really early on, and he absolutely. I, I, oh, are you talking about? Yes, the name's not going to come to me, but he was a disaster. Yes. Yeah. So. I I think it's what is his name? Is it oh, Tristan Visca- Tristan Viscano? Yeah, it was that yeah. FSU kicker? Was it not? I believe so. Uh, no, it was not him. Anyway. But, um, is it? Oh, Rodrigo Blankenship? Maybe I don't know. I can't remember. It's too many names, too many kickers out there. But the point is, is that just because you draft a guy early on in the draft, even way earlier than anybody would imagine, you get drafted. That doesn't make you good. That just means that you're somebody who had a strong reputation. And sometimes it just boils down to the basics. And uh, there are people out there that are still defending Jason Sanders, saying that maybe it's a holding problem. I will say this. Pat McAfee w- went on his show and pointed out something rather interesting. Apparently, Jake Bailey has a tell, um, basically, mm-hmm. that says that, oh, this is when the ball's going to get snapped. So he needs to make that go away. Otherwise, people are going to be blitzing the Dolphins on field goals every single time. We can't afford to let that happen anymore. So... But with that being said, I personally feel like at this point, going 4-0 to start the season is a very real possibility for these Dolphins. And if we can start by just letting all these players get a lot of revenge, I'm wondering if maybe maybe it's not just even the guys that we brought up. It almost feels like this whole team is taking yeah. this, this, this season personally at this point, saying that you guys shot us down so much. We were so good last season, and y'all wrote us off so quickly in favor of other teams because of one reason or another. It feels like that they are taking the whole season personally. Like this whole this whole season is revenge for a lot of these players. Well, I, I think the biggest thing, I think revenge is one thing, but I, I, to me the biggest thing, if a team is going to be competitive in the modern NFL, you got to have belief in your coach and your quarterback. And it does feel like there's a belief in both. And and I and I, I don't can't remember the last time that was the case for the Dolphins. I mean, you could go 
back to maybe Pennington and Sperano and Sperano's first year when the guys were really playing for Tony and kind of came up with a wildcat when they were down one, you know, one and three and all that. But you've never had it in both. I don't think they had it in Wanstead and Fiedler. Um, the defense had it in itself, but I don't think it had it in the others. Uh, you know, I, so, I mean, really, you're talking about Shula and Marino, uh, you know, all the way back. And, and so it, it, it is. We talk about Sean Payton here, and I'm sorry, I may lose connect in a second, but we, we talk about Sean Payton, but, you know, there was belief in Sean Payton and Drew Brees, right, uh, on that Saints team. And, and you know, it, it can elevate a lot of guys on the team who are not elite, and I do think that's where we're at. And also knowing that the coach and the quarterback are aligned is a huge thing. And, again, the Dolphins did not have that during the Brian Flores era. Or yeah. – or the Joe Philbin era, or the Adam Gase era, or 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 any of the other eras or errors with the, with the, with the hard R there. Yeah, uh, to get to it. Yeah, it, it it felt like there were some there was some hope there with a lot of these guys, but none none more so now than with Mike McDaniel. He just seems to be a different kind of guy. So hopefully, Dolphins continue to gain vengeance upon the league and just put their wrath on everybody. So. Let's see if the Dolphins can keep up this momentum and go 4-0 in these next two games. Ethan, I want to thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate the time that you took with, with me here. And uh, like you said, what was it? Better Edge? What's going on with them? Better Remind Edge, you real quick. Code 5 RSN. we got a contest on there right now. Our guy Andy, uh, you can follow him at Gota Marino. He's the pacer this week, so beat him. He can win a whole lot of money. And again, this is Legal Sports Betting. You mentioned prize picks. Use the Code 5. And our friends over at Biscayne Bay Brewing. Absolutely. All right. And with all that said, thank you all so much for joining us. We will see you all Friday for another episode of Finns Nation.